in the tradition again, when the pointing out instruction is given, then you're given four slogans to help you kind of relate to the spirit of working with a non-dual spiritual system, which the Mahamudra and Dzogchen systems are the non-dual spiritual systems par excellence within Tantra. But integral spirituality, the whole integral vision, is based on that model. As Ken puts it, Aqual is nothing more than a completely updated postmodern map of samsara. What's underlying that map of samsara is the recognition of this very state. So what this tradition says about it is basically these slogans kind of have the same format. There's four sentences. It, my invitation to you is to write them down. I think they could be helpful. To you. There are contemplations. First one is too close, you can't recognize it. Too close, you can't recognize it. Too profound, you can't appreciate it. Third one is too simple, you can't believe it. is too good, you can't accept it. Now who's the you in all these statements? What voice? Diane started out with that voice yesterday. It's the voice of the self. It's too close, the self can't recognize it. What does this mean? The 16th Karmapa, one of the progenitors of the Mahamudra tradition in the West, said, looking at the Western students who were assembled in front of him, what you don't understand is that Dharma is closer to you than an eyelash on your eyeball. The Dharma is closer to you than an eyelash on your eyeball. What you don't understand is that Dharma is closer to you than an eyelash on your eyeball. The Dharma is closer to you than an eyelash on your eyeball. What you don't understand is that Dharma is closer to you than an eyelash on your eyeball. The Dharma is closer to you than an eyelash on your eyeball. What you don't understand is that Dharma is closer to you than an eyelash on your eyeball. The Dharma is closer to you than an eyelash on your eyeball. What you don't understand is the Dharma is closer to you than an eyelash on your eyeball. The Dharma is closer to you than an eyelash on your eyeball. What you don't understand is the Dharma is closer to you an eyelash on your eyeball. The Dharma is closer to you than an eyelash on your eyeball. What you don't understand is the Dharma is closer to you than an eyelash on your eyeball. The Dharma is closer to you than an eyelash on your eyeball. What you don't understand is the Dharma is closer to you than an eyelash on your eyeball. The Dharma is closer to you than an eyelash on your eyeball. What you don't understand is the Dharma is closer to you than an eyelash on your eyeball. The Dharma is closer to you than an eyelash on your eyeball. What you don't understand is the Dharma is 
closer to you than an eyelash on your eyeball. The Dharma is closer to you than an eyelash on your eyeball. The Dharma is closer to you than an eyelash on your closer to you than an eyelash on your Dharma is closer to you than an eyelash on your eyeball. Dharma is closer to you than an eyelash on your eyeball. Dharma is closer to you than an eyelash on your eyeball. Dharma is closer to you than an eyelash on your eyeball. Dharma is closer to you than an eyelash on your eyeball. Dharma
not seen it, they're not recognizing it. Similarly, the true, non-dual, always already present nature of mind is too close. So close that the self can't see it. Second slogan, too profound, you can't appreciate it. Our conventional mind, our self-structure, points out is that the basic enemy to this profundity is our speed. And as I mentioned the other day in relation to a question about sleepiness, thickness, the way that speed manifests most of the time is in a kind of numbness towards our experience. We're not actually directly experiencing our experience. The way to begin to clue into ordinary mind, always already one taste mind, is to slow down enough so that experience starts to become self-revelatory. Experience itself starts to reveal its own transparency. Hence, the training involved in the traditional path.
when you start to shift from this side of the equation to this side, which I call the, the movement from here to here, is that the dreamer wakes up to let go of the lives of person, you suddenly realize that all, every second the dream is on. For instance, right now mind is dreaming us talking. There's no one talking. Mind is dreaming us talking right now. Okay? And you can say that intellectually, but there's a funny tipping point where suddenly what I just said becomes a fact and you experience it to be the truth. That there, like the scan does, you know, there's no one's talking, the dreamer is talking in the dream, and if you pay close attention, most talking services the lie dualistically that we are the people we impersonate. Most talking services duality. So that talking on the other side of the equation is non-dual. Now what is mind dreaming? Now what are you doing in the dream? Well, my leg hurts. Well, you have a leg in, and you're in the dream and you have a leg that hurts. That's right. So it's not personal anymore. The word, look, the, it's the end of personalizing anything at all. Because if there are no people, how could anything be personal? And I'm telling you, experiencing that is transformative. It really feels very different. So that the concept of criticism disappears, judgment disappears, and you're more interested in the dreamer's plight as to how he's suffering trying to document and sustain the fiction that he's going to successfully prove he's a person and he's not going to pull it off. You have compassion. You know, you've been there, you know what that feels, you know what sustaining that life feels like. So, I am saying it is a very spiritual experience to be in the dream, aware that the dream is on and you're in it, and that you don't run it, you're flowing with what's happening. You, you give up thinking that you, you can, it's okay to pretend you have plans. I say that to clients, you can have plans, but for God's sake, don't assume they're going to turn out the way you plan. On this side of the equation, mm -hmm. what goes with uh, sustaining the fiction you are the person you're impersonating 
is the concept of intellectuality. Mm -hmm. See, if there are no people, please explain to me intellectuality. Parenthetically, what we're talking about, from, from, what, from the perspective of, of reconnecting with the possibility that we're in a dream that mind is dreaming, mm -hmm. you understand if that's the truth, then truth doesn't sell. That's yeah. not, if 99.9% of the dreamers are, per, are purported, purporting to be people on this side of the equation, mostly playing the part of a victim, they sure as don't want to help, don't want to hear it, hell that they're dreamers. No, no, no. Because they're busy defending the lie there's some kind yeah. of a person and that they're having a miserable life and their money and their house and their children and the Right, they take died. all that very seriously. Yeah, and we, you see, everything serious on this side of the equation as you get reconnect with the fact that this is a dream, seriousness dis disappears. And it's not that you don't care, it's just that you're not reacting to it anymore as if it's content in, in something called life. It's content in a dream. What we start to see in this tradition is that the nirvana that we seek is no further than our own direct experience. The notion that, that there's some separation between samsara and nirvana when we begin to clue into this approach to spirituality is a complete myth. And I wanted to read you just a small section here from Trungpa Rinpoche's book, Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism, where he describes this experience of Talmud Gishepa as the essence of the tantric understanding of reality. And where he unpacks this somewhat paradoxical statement, samsara and nirvana are inseparable. What does that mean in relation to this experience of non Duality. Tantric wisdom brings nirvana into samsara. This may sound rather shocking. Before reaching the level of tantra, you try to abandon samsara and strive to achieve nirvana. But eventually, you must realize the futility of striving and then become completely one with nirvana. In order to really capture the energy of nirvana, and become one with it, you need a partnership with the ordinary world. Therefore, the term ordinary wisdom, Tamagishepa, is used a great deal in the tantric tradition. It is the completely ordinary version of form is form, emptiness is empty. It is what is. One cannot reject the physical existence of the world as being something bad and associated with samsara. You can only understand the essence of nirvana by looking into the essence of samsara. Thus, the path involves something more than simply going beyond duality, something more than mere non-dualistic understanding. You are able to see the non-dualisticness, so to speak, the isness quality of non-duality. You see beyond the negation aspect of shunyata the negation of duality, the causal level absorption. Therefore, the term shunyata is not used very much in Tantra. In Tantric tradition, tatata, -ta -ta, what is, is used rather than shunyata or emptiness. The word osel or prabhasvara, which means luminosity, is also used a lot rather than shunyata. You find this reference to the tantric tradition in the Buddha's last turning of the wheel of Dharma. 
instead of saying form is empty, emptiness is form, and so on, he says that form is luminous. Luminosity is connected with the principle of the great joy or bliss. Right in the midst of our unfabricated, direct experience of whatever it is that's going on, is this recognition. It's present right now. If it were anywhere else, how else could we possibly realize it? If it were anywhere else other than in our own very consciousness, according to this non-theistic view, how could we realize it? The second slogan helps us clue into that. It's too profound. We don't appreciate it. We don't appreciate our own direct experience. We don't understand how to have our experience. What the previous stages of the path are helping us unpack is the degree to which we continuously bypass our direct experience. think that you have to leave yourself in some way or change yourself in some way is the great myth of freedom that Trungpa Rinpoche talked about. It's the great myth of theism which this tradition is trying to understand.